Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me on another of my interview series. Today I'm talking to Giorgio Dea. He is a banking and technology strategist. He's written a book called Banking in the Age of the Platform Economy. And I asked him if he would come on the show and tell us a little bit about how money is created. Because I don't know if, if you're like me, it's been a bit of a strange old time recently with all these different types of money. We're told that cash is king. We've got to hold on to that. There's the threat of digital uh, central bank, digital currency. So it's all a little bit of a strange old thing. So, uh, Giorgio, welcome to the show. Lovely to have you here. Lovely um, to be on the show, Richard. It's, it's very nice to have you. Could you just tell us a little bit about your background? Because I've introduced you as a banking and technology strategist, but I think that there's a bit more to it than that. Yeah, sure. So I mean, I've, I've worked at the intersection of technology and banking for the last 15 years, different companies like IBM, Gartner, Bloomberg, uh, Reuters and so on, advising uh, and working with banks, uh, regulators and also uh, with fintechs. The other hat that I wear is that I, I, I do research. I did my PhD on banking strategies and how banks responded to the rise of the platform economy, the emergence of the fintech revolution and so on. Um, and on the back of that, as you mentioned, uh, there's a book which is being published by De Reuter. It's coming out uh, in June. It's called Banking in the Age of the Platform Economy. So what, what is the platform economy? What do you mean by that? Right. So over the last um, 10 to 15 years, what we've seen is these uh, the emergence of large technology companies that have changed business models, the way that companies uh, work and make them their, their money. Um, and, and so you, you see that across different industries. You have these big platforms like Amazon and, and Google and, and Apple and so on. And they have uh, forced you know, traditional companies to rethink how they um, interact with their customers, how they make money. And a lot of these, these guys have started to think about value co-creation, where they work with an ecosystem of other uh, stakeholders, uh, including potentially startups, including, um, you know, maybe even um, um, companies in the same industry that they would you know, otherwise compete against to work together to co-create value that none could have created in isolation. So that's kind of what the platform economy is. Um, you may have heard of it termed as the sharing economy as well, where people prefer to access goods and services in the sharing markets as opposed to owning them. Um, and that's kind of an, and that's facilitated by these technological platforms. So that's right. that's a big show. And so the book kind of looks at how banks can react to that and strategize for that reality, how they can co-create value and so on. Well, shall we go back in time then to find out how money is created, really? Because um, yeah. I mean, a lot of people find I think banking a bit of a bit of a uh, uh, an alchemy science you know it's a sort of there's a lot of magic and hocus pocus you never quite know because you know what cash is and you know you can go and buy something and and it's all in the private you can you know i'll buy a lawnmower from this chap and he'll buy perhaps something from me or what have you and you you kind of get that right. then if you want to buy a house or something you haven't got enough money you haven't got enough lawnmowers to sell to somebody you've got to get a mortgage and and suddenly you're having to pay that back plus interest and we'll get onto that um and so in the old days it seemed to me that there was a big pile of gold that the king had and and that made you know you could your promise to pay, to pay the bearer related to the money that you actually had now i don't really understand how it's working in the in the modern time so maybe you could go back and sort of tell us how how the banking works yeah so i mean a, a couple of things here um and maybe the, the the reason that I looked at this um, in, in detail. So if we just go back quickly to the, the idea of the platform economy and the idea of um, of these fintechs that are that were set to be disrupting banking and that they would disintermediate banks and would see the end of banking and the rise of fintech. If all that banks are, are pure financial intermediaries, then any other actor um, a more tech savvy actor that comes in and does that intermediation better should in theory logically speaking displace them that didn't right. happen and the reason that that didn't happen is because banks and fintechs are not the same thing banks are different and banks don't simply intermediate money so that led me to dig really deep into this 
and research this as part of my PhD, as part of you know, all the research that I do over many years. And in fact, I, I dedicate um, the fourth chapter of the book on this topic. And it's almost an homage to a very important person that we'll talk about in a second called Richard Werner, who did a lot of work in, in, in the space um, to kind of clarify people's understanding of you know, the role, the important role that uh, banks play in the economy. So I'm looking at it from a narrow perspective. I'm looking at it from strategy, what it means for strategy, but it has implications to monetary policy. It has implications um, for developing countries. It has implications that are far, far reaching and you know uh, that I don't have the expertise to touch on. So, um, you know, I, that's why I'm, I'm very passionate about kind of making people understand that banks are not just like any other company. Right. Uh, any other, they ha they play a very uh, special role. The thing that you mentioned about um, you know gold backed um, uh, currencies. I mean, you know, we we know the story of of the U.S. dollar, which after uh, World War II was part of Bretton Woods, was backed by gold. Um, then it seemed like the Americans were issuing uh, more. Yeah, you know, there, there was a the conversion rate. So if you have you know X amounts of dollars, it gives you so and so many troy ounces of gold. It seems that the Americans were issuing more notes than they had gold. Oh, right. um, President de Gaulle um, and the French were saying, "Hey, you know, uh, we have plenty of dollars. Um, we want our our gold." I think they even sent a, a warship to uh, to New York. Uh, oh, to, to collect it in '65. <laughs> uh, no, '65 wasn't. No, that that's when de Gaulle started kind of saying, "You know, we want the the money back." And it's actually, I think it was. Um, uh in the early 70s that said well you know we we want uh we want the gold because we've got the dollars and then yeah. the british were saying the same thing you know you know we we, we want the gold back and so nixon then said you know what we're going to stop convertibility between um uh, you know pay, do, paper dollars and and gold that was the nixon shock of the right. early 70s and then with Nixon and Kissinger, they went um, to the Middle East and they said, well, you know what, we need to back this um, currency with something else. And hence, they backed it with black gold, with oil. And you know, they talked to the Saudis and, and OPEC and so on and said, OK, well, you're going to sell um, oil um, futures and, and so on and, and you're going to trade oil um, in US dollars. So suddenly the dollar wasn't backed by gold anymore with its specific convertibility after Bretton Woods. but it was backed by oil, right? By, by another commodity of, of, by another, of a certain scarcity, I suppose, it's got to have. Yes, exactly. And and, um, uh, and also a, a certain demand, right? So there's yes, a huge yes. demand for and, and if you have a cartel that controls it, and then you impose on that cartel that, hey, you've got to price it in, in, in US dollars, and suddenly your, your currency is now, you know, it's backed by something else. Yes. That's why when we hear now... Um, that the um uh, that india and, and other countries are saying are starting to say well you know we, we want to buy oil in our own con uh, currency and the opec countries are saying well hmm, okay why not and it's suddenly causing a bit of um, a shift in the system but so that that kind of just to maybe elaborate a little bit on your point about uh the way that currencies are backed but it's more about what i wanted to kind of uh, deep dive on is, is more about how money is created how it comes about how we, how do we create yeah uh, money so um do you do you want to uh, do a uh, continue in, on, on that front yeah no absolutely how is i mean i think a lot of people would be interested in how money where how it's created because you know it does often seem as if it's just poof, there we go we've got a lot more so especially in modern times we've seen during the um the pandemic where suddenly yeah. every you know money was like well we've suddenly got enough money to get keep everybody at home and yet you think well if you had enough money to keep everybody at home how come you haven't had enough money to keep things like the uh, national health service going and all these things that don't have enough money and it, it, you know so it baffles i'm sure a lot of people how this all works well, so over yeah. to you well that, that's why we have inflation now right yeah well, yeah because inflation is correlated with the money supply. If you take a chart of M2, M2 is, is, is the money supply, and you plot it against inflation, it's pretty much they, they go in tandem. So right. the more money you create, the more inf inflation you get. It's, it's, and that was, a, that was a situation in the 70s. A lot of people think that it was the oil shocks 
and and the kind of the Yom Kippur War and the the, the, the kind of the re, um, that caused all of the inflation of the seventies. But if you look at the the money supply, the money creation in the in, in the seventies, um, that preceded uh, the oil shocks, right? And it, it was it started to cause that inflation before. So right. in a way, wars and and uh, supply chains as um, were used a little bit as an excuse. I'm sure they contributed, but it was the money supply and we almost see that now right so now we see <laughs> we see um, the oh, okay we'll see ukraine russia war and, and the supply chain the chain shocks that are causing all this inflation well no it's it's the money printing it's the rampant irresponsible money printing that's been going on for um a few years now you know after covid the, the whole yeah. COVID crisis now so going back to the question how do banks create money so during there's three prevailing theories over the last um I guess 150 or odd years. Up until the 1930s, the prevailing theory um, was the one that I posit is, is the true, the correct one. So, our, in fact, our, our knowledge has declined. Um, and it's called the uh, credit creation theory of banking, which says that, you know, look, banks, when they lend out money, they create that money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was taught in textbooks. If you look at, for example, Henry Dunning uh, McCloyd. Uh, this was in his textbook, you know, so economists and, and, and you know, business people were taught this. If you look, if you were someone that was reading The Economist, this would be the prevailing theory, of course. This would, you know, you had Hartley Withers, who was the editor of The Economist. He spoke about this at length. He published it in The Economist. And then obviously you had these prominent um, economists like Joseph Schumpeter um, and also a very prominent one in, in Germany called L. Albert Hahn, who was also the scion of this big banking dynasty. And even the Macmillan Committee, so our, our own Macmillan Committee in, in, in the UK, which was uh, established to to try to understand, um, you know, how the Great Depression happened, what were the causes, lessons learned, and so on. So that was established by, uh, it's called the Macmillan Committee. Uh, Keynes was, was a key member of that. Even the conclusions of that, um, you know, speak to the fact that banks create money when they lend. Now, after the 1930s, you started so, to have... I'm just going to stop you. When you oh. say they create money, out of what? I mean, how? Is it, I mean, it's not people minting things, but just uh, out of, you know, is it out of thin air? Uh, the short answer is yes. Right. And, and we, can, we can come to that, uh, if you will, when we go into the mechanics. Right. So, okay, but, sure. So the, um, but the short answer is yes. And the right. reality is that when you look at the, the money supply, 97 percent of the money supply is um, created by commercial banks when they lend. So when a commercial bank like HSBC or Lloyd's or whoever it is, when they lend, they create that money, they bring it to life. Um, right. The other three percent, it's the Bank of England that creates the notes and it's the Royal Mint that mints the, the coins. But that's only three percent. And that, uh, that kind of ratio is pretty much similar in most of the developed economies, right? Right. Okay. So we'll, we'll go. We'll get into the mechanics because yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, I just, it's just I know people yeah. will be going when you create something. You, you you know you usually have something there to 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 make it. You know various pieces of material to make something. But effectively, it's more like an idea that the money is in existence. Yes, correct. You, in, in a way, I mean, exactly. if you did, you know. Anyway, we'll we we'll exactly. move, we'll move on to your but second. We, we we will get into the mechanics of it, and you'll yeah. see what I mean by they bring it to life. Brilliant. That that theory was was prominent. Well, it was the the, the main uh, our main way of understanding money creation up until the nineteen thirties, yeah. and then from then on and up until the nineteen sixties, you had the fractional reserve uh, theory of banking, and that is something that you still hear about today. A lot of people, you know. You know, still talk about it yeah i've and heard that term yeah and and what that um so what that theory posits is that banks don't individually create money but the banking system as a whole creates money and the way it does that is that um and this is what the theory says is that you have for every deposit that the bank receives it can lend out several times that deposit right and that right. And, and those that lending then become the uh, deposits in other banks, which in turn become the basis of more um, lending at X times, whatever, 10 times that or whatever right. multiple of, of, of that of that deposit. So you you kind of see it mushrooming in the system. It's not the individual bank that creates it. It's the whole system that creates right. it. Yeah. And so you had prominent um, you know, proponents were um, like the, the English economist Alfred Mar Marshall, 
Paul Samuelson was a, 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 you know, a believer in this. Joseph Stiglitz, who was the chief economist of the World Bank. So this was only prominent and, and kind of the theory for, for 30 years. And then in the 1960s and thereafter, you had the financial intermediation theory of banking, which is what we still have now, which is the main orthodox uh, view of, of uh, the way that banks create, uh, uh, the role of banks and, and you know, where money comes from and what banks do. So what this um, theory posits is that banks are no different than any other company in the economy. Banks, uh, HSBC is like Marks and Spencer's, Barclays is like Costa. They're all different companies and all that banks do is they simply accept deposits, pay a little bit of interest on that, and they're very smart, they're very clever. They, they take those deposits and they, they lend them out, they charge a higher interest. And that delta, that difference in, 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 the, in those deposits is the profit that they, uh, that they make. Um, and there's nothing beyond that. They're just intermediators of, of money. And so, and then there was this huge push in textbooks and you know, uh, economics and uh, across the board to really rubbish the old theories Mm-hmm. Using um, examples like, um, oh, you know, the widow's cruise. Do, you know, do, do, um, do, do the old guys really think that uh, banks have a widow's cruise where they can create money from thin air? Are these guys this is alchemy? These guys are out of their minds. No, of course, that's not what banks do. And yeah, plenty of you know very senior uh, economists like um, Douglas Diamond, Gary Gordon, uh, James Tobin was a big advocate of this. Paul Krugman. Um, and even in, the, in if you look at Europe, that's mostly in the US, but if you look at the Europe, um, you've got uh, Mario Monti, so who's the um, former uh, European commissioner, prime minister of Italy as well. You have John Eatwell, who was a big proponent of this during the 80s. He was the chief econ- economic advisor to the Labour Party um, during the 80s as well. Ben Bernanke, of course, um, chairman of the Federal Reserve. Um, Raghuram Rajan, who's the uh, former chief economist at the IMF, all these big shots, they're all right. massive components of this because banks are just, you know, they're, they're just a regular comp- uh, company. They just move money around. And that's what got me interest- interested in this and that's what got me digging. And um, and then what you had is you had this um, a little bit of a maverick. Um, and I, I quite like this chap. He's a, he's a guy called Richard Werner. He's originally German, but he's based in the UK. He teaches at U- UK universities. He was a former chief economist of Jardine Fleming um, back in the um, early 90s. He did his PhD at Oxford. Very smart guy, clever guy. And he was based in the Far East when you had the Japanese um, asset price um, bubble and collapse and so on. So at the time, during the 80s, people were talking about Japan, as as people are talking now and have been talking about China, it's the it's the next big thing, right? Right. Okay. Um, and at one point, um, the gardens outside of the palace in Tokyo, the, the royal palace in Tokyo, just the gardens were valued uh, more than the entire state of California. So there was a huge speculative bubble in in Japan, and it popped in the in the late um, uh, kind of 90, 1991, that kind of period. And Richard Werner, as a chief economist, as a researcher, as a, a, a guy who's fluent in Japanese, um, he's also seconded to the uh, Bank of Japan and the um, and, and different kind of uh, the Nomura Research Institute there and so on. He, he saw this and he was able to understand the way that the Bank of Japan's unofficial window uh, uh, policy had allowed this um, boom to happen by getting all the commercial banks to lend like crazy, like a bunch of drunken yuppies, right? Mm. And then collapse it. Um, and he was the first person to coin the term quantitative easing. And then he wrote a book called Princes of the Yen, it became a documentary. It's available freely on YouTube. Anyone can watch Princes of the Yen, but the, the book is, is great as well. Where he talks about this, and then, and there was a lot of you know back and forth um, with with the uh, the financial intermediation orthodoxy, and he said, okay, enough. When, when we have disagreements, what do we do? We go to the to the empirical field. We actually go and do an experiment, and we yeah. prove it. And okay. he was the first person. Um, I think he was the first person in history 
to actually do an experiment where he said, okay, I'm going to go to a, a German bank after being rejected by other banks. And I'm going to take, I think it was a 200,000 euro mortgage. But dear bank, I am um, an expert in, in banking. I'm a researcher. I just want to have a look under the hood about the, to see the process of how this happens. Oh, right. Oh, okay. And, and prove that, that this money hasn't come from elsewhere. It's money that you're creating. It has come out of nowhere. It, yes. Um, Effectively. It hasn't come from elsewhere. It's coming yes. from nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it's coming from nowhere. It's n nobody's given it to you to give yes. to me. It's actually, we've just opened a bag and said there's money in it. <laughs> um, kind of. And, and kind then, of. And, and uh, he, he, pub he published his findings in 2014. And then you had, um, um, which is, you know, really highly cited, highly downloaded paper. Um, and I, I will, I'll send it to you so you can also share it with your, uh, with your viewers. Oh, okay. I'll um, put it in the description. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of papers. I'll, I'll share them. And then the, the Bank of England in 2014 released a paper called um, Money Creation in the Modern Economy, which is, you can find it on Google. I'll also send the links for your, for your viewers. It's, it's freely downloadable. Where the Bank of England kind of said, "Oh yes, this you know banks do create money when they lend. That's that's the way it works." Didn't you guys know this? Uh, didn't you guys? So, so that's the, the that's the original way back in the 1930s. So it's sort of this before. is before yeah. what, before up until all these others. Can I ask you a question? That's been as you've <laughs> spoken. It's it sort of occurred to me if you can create money out of nowhere to lend, yeah, and then people pay a bit more to pay it back. The money that you've created, what you get back is a lot more because there's been interest paid on it. Uh -huh. So that, that, that interest is called seniorage, and it's, called, it's a pure economic rent. Let me explain the mechanics, yep. and, I'll, and then once I explain the mechanics, we'll get back to the interest. Okay, yeah, no, no worries. I just thought, I just because as you were saying, I thought, well, you've got all this money, and then they pay a bit more, and then the money comes back. So they end up with more money than they started. And I thought, that's a very good business plan, isn't it? But anyway, go on to the mechanics. <laughs> but... But that, that's that's a pure economic rent. It's it's seniorage in the, that they charge as as interest. We'll get to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So let's let's just go into basic accounting, right? Mm -hmm. Any company, small, medium enterprise, whoever it is, will have an idea of, of accounting, right? You have your balance sheet, you have your assets on one side, yeah. and you have your liabilities on the other side. Assets on the left, liabilities on the right. Um, now, if you are a non-bank. So you could be um, a broker, mm -hmm. right? You could be a real estate agent, it could be anyone, right? Um, you can lend, individuals can lend. Lending is not a regulated activity. You and I can-, can So can I lend. could lend you a fiver and, and you could pay yeah. me whatever so back. Let, let, let's say you have a, a real estate company, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Richard Phobes, real estate company. Um, and you want, um, to lend me a thousand pounds okay when you and i agree on the terms you we sign a contract that loan contract then becomes uh, an asset for you so on the left hand side on the asset side you yeah. now have a contract a piece of paper worth a thousand pounds your assets have increased by a thousand pounds yes but you've got to pay me that money so then on the other side on the liability side you have an accounts payable liability of a thousand pounds yeah because you, you have to disperse that money to me yeah so you've got a a loan worth a thousand on the assets and an accounts payable liability also worth a thousand on the liability side it balances right yeah so basically yeah. it it, it kind of cancels each other out to, to naught in a way but, but that is yes but that's that's step one yeah right? because you you've increased both sides but yes that, that's only half the story right the second half of the story you actually got to give me the money, right? Because oh you know, yes, that's true. Right. I forgot about. I've got to give you the money. <laughs> so, so what you would then do is you would let's go back to the asset side. You would yeah. go into your till, yeah. or into your safe, um, or into your savings account, and you yeah. would withdraw a thousand pounds. There you go. Ten. <laughs> That's good so, enough. Yeah, it represents so you, the, it represents the thousand pounds. So I've got to give that to you. You've got to give that to me. So you, you're going to withdraw that from your cash, from yes. your savings. So on the asset side, the cash now has reduced by a thousand. So remember, we increased it, uh, increased it by a thousand when we had that contract. Yes. Yeah. A bit of paper. 
a bit of paper. So that's a thousand on the asset. So your assets yeah. have up. But as soon as you remove the money from the, the till and you give it to me, the assets that have now gone down a thousand. Yeah. So on, on the left hand side, you're back down to zero. Yeah. yeah. On the right hand side, as soon as you disperse, as soon as you, you give that money to me, you cancel out the accounts payable liability. You don't have a liability anymore. You've, no. you've, done, you've done what you promised. Yes. So you're back down to zero. Zero here and zero there. Yeah. Well, anyone can in, in the economy can lend. Lending is not a regulated right. activity. What is a regulated activity is deposit taking. If if I if you're a real estate company and I said, you know what, I really want this house, I'm gonna give you a thousand pounds deposit, you know, please just earmark it for me. You can accept deposits, but it's highly regulated. So there's, you know, if you look at the FCA handbook, they've dedicated an entire chapter to um, client money rules. Same thing with the SEC in, in, in the US. So if I you know, give you a deposit, that money needs to be segregated in a separate account. Right. And there's specific rules as to what kind of accounts you can put it. You can put it into a savings account, you can put it into a money market fund, so on and so forth. But it's segregated. It can never appear as part of your balance sheet. Right. Okay. If you, it's a separate thing completely. So if your real estate company goes under, right, that uh, client money account is a separate thing. Yeah, you can't pay Peter to pay Paul out of that when your business is going, you know, and you're in desperate times because even though you could see the money, you can't use the money. It's not yours. It's not. It's it's yeah. segregated, and that's that's why we had the whole FTX scandal as well because they were contravening those rules. All oh, right, a different story. Oh, well, that so, so that is separate, right? It's completely right. separate. So deposit taking is highly, highly regulated. Yeah. Now, guess who is exempt from those client money rules? Got to be the government. No. No. It's again. Um. Well, a bank, it's said, no, it can't be. The commercial banks. The commercial banks. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, so that was a personal thing. But commercial banks are allowed to... to so, yeah, to so, tell me so, what so they So commercial banks are exempt from the client money rules. Right. So they're the same as any other company. They're different. Yes. Because they're exempt, right? Yeah. And, and so, it, now, let's do the same scenario again. Mm -hmm. This time you're not a real estate company. This time you're a licensed bank. Right, it's the Richard Vobes Bank. Hang on, I'll have to fully be a bit, bit more authoritative here. Right. Oh, welcome to the Richard Vobes Licensed Bank. Thank you very much. No riffraff. Exactly. <laughs> Will you let me in? Yeah, you look you look smart. I'll let you in. Yeah, we. You look wealthy we, as well, so you can come in. <laughs> we we yeah. share the same hairstyles. So exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is the Richard Vobes Baldy Bank. You have to be bald to come in. So, so if you're a bank. You're yeah. exempt from that rule. Now, this is the way it would work at a bank. The first step is the same. You, you and I, uh, as the bank, we agree that, um, you know, you're going to lend me a thousand pounds. Yeah. So the technical thing is that I issue, so me as an individual, I issue uh, this this loan uh, contract, which you acquire. Right. Oh, okay. So I'm lending you the money, but you're going to issue the contract. I'm issuing you a security. This this piece of paper issued right. as a security, which is an IOU. You're going to oh, okay, yeah. buy that off me. So now you have this IOU on your assets, right? On the yes. asset side. It's IOU. on the asset side. Great. It's on the asset side, and it's a thousand pounds. Yeah. Now, obviously, you've now created on the other side, on the liabilities, a one thousand pound um, accounts payable liability because you've got to pay me that money yes so up until this point it's the same as richard vove's real estate yeah right? but this is where it starts to differ because you're a bank and because you're exempt from client money rules and because you control both sides of the ledger because you do both deposit taking and lending um you can take that um accounts payable liability the liability yeah. And you can just rename it as a client deposit or a customer deposit. And you can just show me that and say, look, you've now got a deposit, right, um, at, at Richard Vobes Bank. So what you've done is you've not zero, zeroed out. You've actually inflated both sides of the balance sheet, the assets and liabilities, by an equal amount. So every time Even you... though no money has changed hands. Exactly. Just a, just a contract. 
So if 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 you're if you have uh, loose lips, you might say, I've, "I'm going to transfer you the money." That's very wrong. You're not transferring me the money. What you would say is, "Your um, uh, the the money now appears in in your uh, as an account uh, in as a deposit in uh, in our accounts." That would be the correct way of saying it. Right. right? So it's, so it's now, just on. It's just on paper. I mean, yes. there's no there's no shoebox with actual money you know coins of the realm or anything it's just on paper suddenly there it is oh, on a computer that. you've just yeah. typed it into a computer well on a computer yes these days typed yes, it course. into a computer and you've as, as soon as we make that agreement what yeah. you've done is you've you've um acquired a um an iou that i've issued yes. which is on your assets that's why when you lend it's on your assets yes and guess what you've then said to me look that account's payable is now a, um, a de deposit on the liability side. Now, he here's here's the important thing. Why is the deposit on the liabilities? Think about it from a logical pr perspective. You have a bank that's mm -hmm. saying that the deposit is on the liability side. It's because when you deposit money at the bank, you lend to the bank. You, so when I go and I put money at, in the bank, it's not like I'm, I'm asking the, the bank to kind of put it in a vault or to kind of act as my... Uh, I'm actually lending. That's why you need to read the, the, the fine print. I'm lending right. my money to the bank, and I become a general creditor to the bank. If the bank fails, I will be one of the, probably the last people to get paid, <laughs> which is why a lot of people have, uh, and a lot of banks now need to have uh, deposit protection insurance, which ensures the you know a certain amount of money. Yes, uh, depends on the country and so on. But beyond that, um, if it's the a bank gamble, fails, yeah. If, if if the bank fails, that deposit is you lending to the bank. That's why it's oh, on the I see. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think a lot of people still think that you put the money in the bank and it sits in a vault and that's it. You know, it's your money. But you're actually lending so they can then do with that what they need to do. And that might be lend to other people, etc. Um, so they, they wouldn't use that as a basis um, necessarily to lend, right? But I mean, that, that, that's, that's just that going into the weeds. But in, in mm. principle... Yes, you are, lend, you are lending. You're lending your cash to the bank, and they consider that as a deposit. That's why it's, it sits on the liability side. Right. Oh, All I see. All deposits are a liability for the bank because we're lending them. You know, they yeah. have to. In principle, they should you know pay it back uh, with a tiny bit of interest, <laughs> and um, but you're just a general creditor. If the bank goes under, um, you know, there, there's a you know, different hierarchy of who gets their money back and. You, you're not at the top. You're of not that. very high, even though you've lent no. them the sodding money to begin with. Yes, that's why you have all the, the terms and conditions of. Yeah. Uh, when well, you're, um, you know, they're, they're very mean, aren't they? <laughs> so, so that, so that's how that's the mechanism through yeah. which banks create new money every time they lend. So every time we agree uh, to lend, they inflate both sides of the balance sheet. On one side, that uh, loan contract becomes um, an asset for them. Right. On the other side, they. The accounts payable is renamed as a deposit, and that then you accept that as them having dispersed their their duty of of, of you know uh, mm. making money available to you. So then the question arises: is well, why are they charging interest? Because let's go back to the previous example of Richard Forbes Real Estate. Yeah. If if you're um, if I'm borrowing from you. I have to pay you interest because that one thousand pounds that you have in the till or in the savings account or somewhere else, you could use that in another way. You could mm. invest it in uh, stocks. You can give it to someone else who who uh, who could use it. It's it's money that so you're foregoing that money. Yes, and, I've been inconvenienced you know, by lending it yeah. to you, I suppose, because I can no longer use it. Yeah, mm. or, or also you could you could have potentially invested it elsewhere and gotten a return. So yeah. you, we need to agree on 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 how I will remunerate you. Yes, for the fact that you're making that available to me, right? And so that's the interest that I that I pay you, and we agree. Okay, I'll pay you five percent in a year's time. But if you know the bank doesn't do that, the bank you know, Richard Vogue's bank is now creating uh, that money. Why are they charging interest? They they, they haven't. Um, it's not like they're foregoing another use. No. Right? So that's called seniorage. And seniorage. So, seniorage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's a pure economic right. But what, what is seniorage? Seniorage comes from the French, uh, le droit du seigneur, the right of the Lord, from the feudal. Uh, I see. 
So do you, I don't know if you're aware of the le droit du Seigneur, the right of the Lord in feudal times uh, of the... He would take a certain amount from the, the serfs. Um, yeah, there was another context to it, which isn't very pleasant. And it's usually when when the, the, the peasants got married, uh, the Lord would have the right of the first um, night with the... With the wife. Or yes. The, with the wife-to-be. Yes, that's the le droit du Seigneur. So it's not very pleasant, but if you take that and use maybe the same terminology to see what the banks are doing to uh, the yes. peasants, <laughs> yeah, I'll let you use your imagination. Yes. That's where it comes from. So it's it's um, it's 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 seniorage. They derive seniorage from the interest that they uh, charge on um, on the the loans that they create. And so and presumably that's you know that's an approved legal thing. They're allowed to do you over in that way. Well, they do, don't they? So presumably yes. they they've got yeah. It's uh, the yes. the legal profession it says yeah yeah you can do that, mate. No worries. Mr. Bank. Yeah, I mean, this, this is it, right? They're, they're exempt from the client money rules, and uh, um, all of this is. Um, I mean, and the thing is, it's. I mean, in and, in and of itself, creating, um, allowing commercial banks to create money doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, right? And this is. Right. Um, and again, looking at the banking profession, like any other profession, it should be an honourable profession. It's just bad actors that give it a bad name. Mm. Um, it's what you do with the money um, that determines um, whether it's a good use or, or, or not. So are you creating money for productive, for production, things that go into uh, the, G, the GDP? I mean, if I want to, I don't know, if I want to set up a business or buy a house or do something that involves a lot of capital, I don't have that money now. Um, it's okay if I go to the bank and I say, look, I, I pledge the next 20 years of my labor or part of the t next 25 years of my labor in return for you making that available for, to me now so that I can produce, so I can you know, set up mm. a business or I can buy a house to live in and so on. Um, so, you, so you could, certainly for production, um, that goes into the GDP. That's a, it's a good use of money creation. But when you, you can also create money and, and have it for speculation, where you know you're kind of gambling on all sorts of derivatives and uh, you know um, securitization and, and all sorts of dodgy stuff. And the um, that's that's the alchemy, right? Um, or potentially in just rampant consumption or irresponsible consumption, which then also creates inflation. So, so those things. Um, not a good use of, of money creation. So it's it's not so much that it's a bad thing that these guys, I mean, look, I, I leave that to, to others to, to kind of yeah. discuss the, the pros and cons, but um, it's what you do with that money. And so a lot of these banks have been creating money and, and, and using it for speculation and using it for uh, to promote, you know, irresponsible levels of consumption and blowing up all these big asset uh, bubbles across different asset classes. And, um, that's that's caused all sorts of um, uh, pain economically, right? Whereas if you were to, you know, create that money and and point it towards productive, um, you know, business creation and so on, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, one of the things that um, that we need is actually more banks. Everyone's talking about decentralization. If you want decentralized finance, if you you know forget Bitcoin, if you want real decentralization we need more banks but we need the local banks community banks uh, cooperatives credit unions banks that live and breathe in communities and societies where they know the local businesses the local environment they lend to them and that creates economic growth so all the decision making is is with that community rather than one central bank i mean like the you know the fear that we've got of a central bank digital currency which is somebody somewhere at the top of the pyramid is making the decisions all the way down you're saying that actually and it seems it seems blatantly obvious now you say it that if we had more banks and and i mentioned to you before we started filming yeah. that, uh, that there was a film called the bank of dave and i think yes. it's in bradford that set up purely really to do the local area yeah. and so the more of those we had the, the far better i mean because i remember in the old days you had a bank manager who knew yeah. your business and would ask you about your business and and would offer certain pieces of advice that would be tailored just for you because they understood you and they could nudge you in a different way and that sort of thing 
exactly and, and we need and we need more of that and then you've just triggered kind of three thoughts um uh now and it's, uh, it's you know one thing is about central bank digital currency so what remember when we talk about the 97 percent of money that is created by commercial banks well that is um bank digital currency bdc mm -hmm. the only difference that we have with central bank digital currency is that now the central bank is going to to to, to be issuing that that um that digital currency and there's two flavors of it you have wholesale cbdc which is not as scary as you know uh, wholesale uh, central bank digital currency is just a better way for the banks amongst themselves to settle at the end of the day they they use um something called re uh, real time gross settlement now to to settle the way that you know that they transact across the day it's just a maybe a more efficient way of doing that but the one that kind of like uh, gets my spidey sense going is the retail CBDC. And re what retail CBDC means, it means that it's the ability of the central bank to issue um, currency the way that the, the commercial banks do, but directly to individuals. So it's, it's like you and I have an account at the central bank. Um, and the bit that freaks me out is the, um, the, the, progr the programmable side of it. So it's the ability to program that money, so the money could potentially uh, expire, uh, mm -hmm. or it could be used for certain things, but you know, not for others. So that, is, so the ability for a central bank to issue currency to you and I, which is programmable, which which there are certain, you know, you can't use it. You, you've traveled twice this year; that's enough. You can't travel a third time. Exactly. You can use it else. Yeah, or and, and I think it. a lot of people are scared by that, you know, because it becomes very big brother that somebody uh, else is determining what you and your alienable rights, your inalienable rights should be able to do and what you do do with cash and to an extent with your debit card or credit card, you can buy and stuff and nobody really knows because all the banks at the end of the day just do all of the, the, they settle it all at the end of the day and they're not individually going, oh, hang on a minute, that bloke's just bought a, another gallon of petrol. We shouldn't allow that because uh, he's, you know, he's had too many gallons of petrol because it's not he's, saving the planet. He's, he's hit his quota, yeah, exactly. So that, that's that's the bit where it's a little bit kind of like, as you said, big brother. And also, I'm not sure it's a foregone conclusion because it it puts the central banks in competition with the commercial banks. So it's like that, that's another area to kind of, that we can spend some time talking about but the, the other thing that kind of what you said triggered in my mind as well is that um well we just had we just seen the the silicon valley bank collapse now and mm. um silicon valley bank is um it collapsed because you know it had bad risk management it had things that were specific and you know idiosyncratic to to silicon valley bank um but you have a a lot of um the rumor mill of you know the the, the oh, it is a systemic and so on. and and part of that is maybe right it, this is beneficial for larger banks because if the the small guys the the medium guys i mean okay silicon valley bank is the 16th biggest bank in, in the us it's not tiny but if other small and medium banks start to go under as we did uh have in the savings and loan crisis back in the 80s this is good for the big banks. They consolidate, they become bigger and, and so on. And, and, and you know, it goes against what we were talking about before, which is the need for more banks, more community banks. Right, yeah. So it's, and, um, we see, and we see that in other sectors, don't we? Big corporations buying up smaller fry and then it, and just amalgamating them as part of their thing and, and everything changes and you, you end up with, you know, your large, uh, well, your larger corporations who are controlling more of the things right, and less independence. But, but, but exactly, but, but but that's tightly coupled to how much big banks you have versus small and medium banks, because the big banks, they want to lend to the mega corporations, but the um, smaller and medium sized banks, they're more geared towards lending to small and medium businesses, right? Small enterprises, uh, local enterprises, and so on. So the more of those that you have, um, the more... SMEs get supported, the more yes. that you have this kind of um, uh, economic, local economic engine that's kind of revving. Um, and there's an, there's, a, there's an interesting study where they looked at, um, I forgot what they, they termed them, because you obviously you've got the big companies, and you've got the SMEs, but then you've got one, like a, a segment in, in between, 
which are companies that are bigger than SMEs. They're not big multinationals, but they they are um, large and established, typically in in, in one region. Um, and they are, they employ a lot of people. They're a big engine for growth, economic growth, and they're, they're like hidden gems. I think that's what they called them. And they looked at you know what country has the most hidden gems, and um, I think that, that what they found was that it was Germany. And Germany, apart from Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank, all the other banks that they had, they, they have lots of Reifens and banks and Landes banks and and these kind of community banks. So a lot of these local community banks they lend to these sorts of local uh, businesses that become larger champions that employ people that that produce a lot that you know um, um, that contribute so much to gdp and to growth and so on so we need more local banks and um, i'm not saying that that money creation is a bad thing it's what what do you do with it do you point it towards the casino style speculation um or do you use it for, you know, uh, production, um, productivity, and so on? That, that that's that's kind of the, um, uh, the 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 point that kind of you you triggered in, in my mind as you said that as well. Right. So there's a lot. So so in terms of, I mean, these little these, these banks, like you said, with the uh, the one in San Francisco, the Silicon Valley Bank. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you see online, there's a lot of sort of chatter at the moment. I was getting agitated myself thinking, oh, my God, you know, it sounds like there's going to be a run on the banks. They're all going to start collapse. What do we do with our savings? Should we be going into crypto, into Bitcoin? Should we be buying great lumps of gold and what? But I think from what you're saying is because there was bad management in that particular bank and, and then there might be a bit of a scare with the very smaller banks, but the big ones are quite happy with that and they'll go, yeah, well, that's fine. We'll just gobble them up, take their clients and, and make more money out of it. Yeah, I mean, Silicon Valley Bank, they, they had bad risk management, uh, right. bad asset liability management and so on. They, they, they didn't even have a chief risk officer for a good eight months. Um, so they didn't behave well in terms of risk management and you know part of that is okay well are the regulators partly responsible because you know up until 2008 you had um, you know rampant deregulation and then you had the crisis and then the regulatory burden on banks increased with dodd frank with basel three and, and others and in 2018-19 you had um, one of the um uh, so you had kind of a relaxation of Dodd Frank requirements for banks uh, that have assets up to 250 billion, so which are considered the kind of medium sized and smaller banks. So they said to them, "Look, you don't have to have uh, uh, you don't have to comply with Dodd Frank in as stringent a way as the larger guys do." Right. So. For example, you don't have to maintain a living will. That's part of Dodd Frank and Basel III. You don't have to maintain in the same way. You don't have to do the same stress test. You don't have to have the same liquidity, uh, stringent liquidity and capital requirements. Um, but regardless of that, even if if that was the case, you'd still expect that a bank would manage its risk better because that's part of the bread and butter of, of banking. And it seems yeah. that these guys, they were lending a lot to, and they were doing a lot of business with the the high tech sector with these venture capital firms and so on, and they had um, uh, they grew very quickly, and they didn't have robust enough controls, and that precipitated their their collapse. Yeah. Now there may be other small and medium banks that behaved in a similar way, so right. it's going to be scary. And they're for all them. a bit rocky as well. The ones that behaved in a similar yeah. way, but the this is going to be this is going to be a feeding frenzy for the large banks. Right. Um, Oh, okay. So, so banks like you know you're the ones on the high street, your high street banks that many of my viewers may be going. Oh, should Our I be? Yeah, species. they're going to be they're going to be okay at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, rationally speaking. Yeah. Yes. Unless, no, yeah. Unless the world suddenly all ran for their money, <laughs> but that's not the situation. We're not in that situation. Anybody watching this? No. Don't. I'm in the queue first, mate. I want that. <laughs> I want that tenor back. So, so listen. I, I I say that with a big caveat. That yes, of course. Um, with a big caveat that, from what we know so far, right? Um, rationally speaking, but anything can happen in the next half hour. 
as they uh, say in Stingray. <laughs> <laughs> Anything for that. Well, you never know, do you? You just never know what suddenly bubbles up from nowhere. No, but rationally but, but speaking, rationally, yeah. rationally speaking, when you look at all of the um, the way that the other big banks hedged uh, against interest rate, interest rate risks and so on, um, okay, may, maybe they take a slight hit, but it, you know they've got the buffers. They're, they should be fine. Um, I think where you have a, the, the rumor mill kind of working, there are some people that benefit from that. So certainly yeah. a lot of the banks would benefit from it because if some of the, the smaller guys they go on, snap they, them up. they can snap them up. And also um, any large uh, tech company or other stakeholders that benefit from um, interest rates not going up because they got hooked on zero on easy money, um, for them making this seem to be a bigger crisis is good because they can say to the Fed and to the other central banks, hold on a second, I know that you're trying to you know, combat uh, inflation by increasing interest rates and so on, but look, you've just caused a banking crisis, stop it, put the interest rates back down or lower them or, or you know, pause the, the, the rate hikes. And those are typically businesses that benefit from low interest rates, access to easy money, because you know um, if you look at the tech sector and the bubble that's grown there, it's like the age of uh, um, irrational exuberance. There's tons of hubris and tons of speculation in that space. Where, you know, if you're um, um, if you're a little startup um, that uh, you know, spins out a few buzzwords, blockchain this, AI that, disrupt this, and then you go to a, a venture capital firm, it's like, okay, here's five million, and then they know that it's a it's a game. They'll just you know lump a lot of debt on, onto you, make you bigger than, than you seem, chase the market share instead of profitability, and then go and dump you to another venture capital for whatever, 30 bill, uh, million, who then in turn do the same thing. And it's kind of a, a hot potato scenario where you know, it's good for all the other guys, but it's the one that's left holding the, <laughs> the um, this inflated uh, startup with tons of debt and uh, yeah. lots of buzzwords, but not much more sees it kind of uh, collapse. So, there's, so I think the bigger problem that I, I think, right, and again, this is my opinion, is in is in the tech sector, which has just been in this bubble that's inflated as a result of all of this easy money um, that kind of needs to pop because, you know, we, we need innovation, we need technology, all that sort of stuff, but it's, we need to rationalize it, we need quality as opposed to just hype jobs. And we've had that for a long time. And the facilitator of that has been the rampant money printing and access to easy money that these banks have just well we we I, I we might have to get you back because i think on another session we're sort of running out of time now but on another session it would be great to talk about um how ca how can a government for example just print what seems to be we went through the pandemic and there was you know there wasn't any money and then yet suddenly the uh the now Prime Minister, who was, of course, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, could magically make enough money from somewhere um, to pay people to stay at home and, and keep the, the so-called economy going. And then, dis and yet, throughout history, or to say that government's history, they've not been able to do the same thing and, and pay for services like the NHS and the police and the fire and all these, you know, all these sort of creaking services. They couldn't do that before uh, to look after and make sure our hospitals were top of the thing. But I, I know we said before that's a whole other animal. And, and, and just it's not so much the government that, that prints the money. It's that the, the money. It's it's the commercial banks that create the money. The yeah. most of the, money, the overwhelming majority of it. And it's the central bank and the mint that that, that print a tiny bit at uh, three percent. So you're absolutely um, right. And we had. An incredible amount of uh, an incredible increase in the money supply since 2020 uh, after COVID uh, or during COVID. If you look at it on a chart, it just spikes up. And if you take again, I'll, I'll reiterate this: if, if you take any chart of the M2, which is the money supply, yeah. and you plot it against inflation, you'll see that when the money supply increases, inflation increases. It happened in the 70s. It's happening now. And people were talking about this two years ago. Lots of people mentioned it um they won't listen to if you print money in the way that you're printing money and just creating money in, in this way it's going you're going to cause inflation and that's what we have now and the official rate of inflation i don't know what it is but uh, the the real inflation that we feel is probably a lot higher um in our daily lives so it's right. um 
this is what you get from from money printing. But ha happy to have a, a, another conversation whenever I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Fantastic. Well, Giorgio, it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, and we will leave those links in the description. You've got your book. The, it's coming out in June, I think you said. Yeah, uh, banking yeah. in the age of the uh, platform economy. So those people who you know, are interested in all of that do go ahead. And all those other links that uh, Giorgio is going to send. But it's really you've actually um, given me a real insight into that. I mean, to some people, they might go, oh, my goodness, it's quite complicated and it's quite dry. But you, I think we've made it as, as but, entertaining at the same time as possible. But, but do you know what? Banking and financial services should not be complicated. It's not complicated. And what another thing that I'm very passionate about is making sure that not just, you know, you know the adults, but also young people yeah. are taught about money, budgeting, financial services, and so well, on. Well, we could talk about that. <laughs> why is that not being taught in schools? You know, why are young it's, people it's, not learning it? It's not complicated. Banking is not complicated. You have people. So anyone that wants to purposely make something more complicated than it is, than it, than it is, is trying to hide something. Yes. And or they're trying to be clever. You have a lot of these derivative guys that love to spit out these. Um, um, Greek uh, symbols, delta this and gamma that, and whatever, and they, they feel they're very smart and algorithmic. This banking shouldn't be difficult. It's it's simple. It, it shouldn't require um, advanced degrees. It's simple. We m money is something that that we interact with on a daily basis. Absolutely. It's that people, you know, kids from the age of you know, five and six. I teach my kids about this, and they're what you know, nine and eight. Um, and I've been teaching them for a couple of years, and they get it. They're, they get it better than I than I do. Yeah, well, um, you know, kids. If you if you get them right, you know, they're sponges. They'll learn really quickly and get them it's enthused. It's not difficult, and yeah. we should all we should all know this. We should learn it, and it's not difficult. It's been obfuscated in different ways and complicated with lots of different acronyms and terms. But it isn't. You know, banking shouldn't be this complicated, and it should be something that everyone understands. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, Giorgio, thank you so much for joining us today. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. How about that? Um, and yeah, it would be great to get you back and have a, another thank conversation you. in a month or so's time and uh, ask all those other questions. And maybe the audience will come up, come up with a bunch of questions that they also want to be putting you on the spot. That's the thing. <laughs> It's, but anyway, it's thank you. It's very great. Thank you very much. Uh, join me again for another of my interview series, which will be coming up fairly soon. But until then, from Giorgio and I, goodbye. <laughs>